presentations going on outside, so. Is it okay if I start? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Oh. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed your break. Looks like we've got a nice uh, intimate group for this session. My name is Eric Charles Hawkinson. Please call me Eric. I'm originally from the States. I've been in Japan for about 10 years. I teach at a university here in Kyoto, but not in the city. I'm up in the mountains close to the uh, Sea of Japan in a city called Fukuyama, and this uh, school is called Seibi University. And uh, lately, I've been, I've, I've designed a few textbooks for the classes I teach, and I've been working on ways to in, enhance them and using augmented reality as a way to bridge some online resources with the printed materials that we use in class. And today I'm going to be talking about mostly design principles involved in using augmented reality to enhance already existing textbooks for, uh, to utilize a lot of the uh, materials that are available online or in uh, apps and things like that. Come on in. So, to begin with, I'm just going to talk about the concept of augmented reality. From this point, I'll just call it AR. And I'll talk about all the uh, emerging technologies having to do with AR up until this point, uh, some of the classifications of augmented reality and what they mean for language learning. And then I'll go into some tools that all of us can use to enhance existing printed material with augmented reality, and uh, then I'll demo some of the products that are things that I've been making, and then talk about some of the design challenges that went into it, and the design uh, principles involved in creating these types of uh, materials. And since this is a small group, if you have questions in the meantime, but, and uh, don't want to wait to the end, I don't mind if you interrupt me, we can do that too. Uh, anybody first-timers to Kyoto? First-timers? Uh, <coughs> this is actually a street in Kyoto. Does anyone else kn know where this is? Uh, close. Very close. <laughs> this is uh, Kawadamachi. It's a very popular shopping district. So we. this is a very rare scene where there's actually no one here. I think there's maybe like four, five, six in the morning. This is usually bustling with people. But uh, one of the most widespread uses of augmented reality is the use of uh, location uh, services and GPS data to augment what's going on around you and help guide you, navigation, things like that. So just to give you an idea of what it might look like. So you're here at the street and you'll hold up your smartphone, smart device as a camera and it's taking in that data and showing the, the visual data that's coming in through the camera and it will augment it in some way using uh, a GPS data, data from, for example, maybe uh, Google Places will tell you if you're looking for uh, where to get money, it'll, sh it'll look that up on uh, some, uh, maybe some Google Maps or something and it will uh, overlay that information on top of what's happening through your uh, smartphone camera. And uh, even smarter ways to use it, you can connect those uh, resources to your social media apps and now you know where your friends have been in accordance to what's happening uh, to real time coming in from data from your camera phone. This is kind of the, the oldest use that I could think of of actual augmented te uh, technology, augmented reality technology starting back 30, 40 years ago. This is called a heads up display for air airlines. This is actual, what he's looking at flying the plane and it's been augmented with data from uh, his altitude, longitude, everything like that. What Google, uh, Wikipedia has to say about augmented reality is that a live copy view of a physical real world environment whose elements are augmented or supplemented by computer generated sensory input such as sound, video graphics, or GPS data. So there's a lot of uh, confusion sometimes between augmented reality and virtual reality. A virtual uh, world is something almost completely simulated, and a uh, augmented reality is using 
some portion of data physically around you. It could be just your location, your GPS location. It could be uh, physical objects around you. And that information is being used and augmented, changed in some way. And it's kind of in uh, debate right now, but uh, some people are calling augmented reality somewhat of a eighth mass medium. There's, there's some of them listed here, starting with print in the late 15th century, recording, cinema, radio, television, internet, mobile in the late 2000s, and augmented reality starting sometime maybe one or two years ago. And the reason why this is kind of still in debate is because some people claim that Augmented reality is just a subset of mobile technologies, and you need the mobile technologies to uh, use or implement the augmented reality. But the opposite side of that is uh, lately there's a lot of other things coming out, like wearables, watches, the eyeglasses, and things like that. So augmented reality can be used in all of those subsets. So there are very different types of augmented reality. And this is kind of a uh, emerging technology still, so the types are still a little vague. And this is something I've come up with to classify I'm using several different uh, papers that have come out trying to classify types of augmented reality. I've taken a couple of them and just kind of combined them together. And one type is camera tracking. So augmented reality based on your uh, mobile device taking in data from the camera, from the sensor of the camera, and augmenting that in some way. And that could be either using a marker or no marker, which I'll show you in just a minute. And then there's non-camera tracking, which just uses, uh, you could use information from the camera to display, but it's not using any of the information coming into the camera sensor to augment. It's just using perhaps where you're located using the GPS sensor, where you're moving using the motion sensors in your iPhone and things like that. And the last one is using those in combination in some way. So you're both using the camera and different inf information coming into it to augment it, and your GPS location in tandem in some way. Here is some samples of a tracking marker. I have a couple of them I'll show you a little bit later. But this stuff, this came out in a uh, little over 10 years ago. There was something called the AR toolkit that actually originated in uh, Japan. And it takes these markers that, uh, it's kind of like the next succession of the QR code. And uh, you save these images into a device, usually a computer. In this days, it would be your PC with a webcam. And uh, then you would take usually a 3D object and overlay that on top of the printed object in here. So you would, every time this object would appear to your camera, so software would know, would, would recognize it, and then overlay a 3D uh, model on top of it. And it might look something like this. So these are the same markers in early use of this type of technology. And it was mostly used in uh, drafting, engineering, schools like that, to know what was inside of moving parts and moving pieces. And you can go inside and actually move objects around in a 3D environment and take a look at it. And you can actually pick the markers up and move them around and manipulate them as well. And uh, even as far as gamification goes, there has been some, a lot of attempts to use the same uh, technology to gamify things. Uh, I even saw a chessboard that was just pieces of markers and you had to look through it through the uh, augmented reality piece and when they pieces got together they would simulate a battle or something. And what's really exciting is that uh, we have, it, this takes a lot of processing power, so we're kind of getting to the, the age where we don't really need these markers to augment our, or use, have the computer try and track them. Because it's, in the 3D environment, a square is the easiest thing to track. You can move it left, right, up, down, and the computer can calculate that that's still a square. Now, using these are the new generation consoles, the PS4 and the Xbox, have the camera sensors on them. And they're so sophisticated that they will <coughs> know your body in a 3D environment all the way down. 
and they can even register your uh, your posts. So these guys are inviting. Uh, these are all augmented. These are creatures that are, that are put out, and they're interacting with them through the camera, through their mo physical movements. And this is something that my university is actually looking into because we have a uh, Department of Medical Information Technology, and they're, I'm working with a couple of professors there because they're uh, trying to develop a telemedicine, telefitness uh, study using these technologies. So this is a, a, an example of a non-tracking. It's almost like the first example I showed you earlier. Uh, all this data you see here is uh, stores in your recent vicinity. That, that data may have come from some uh, website or uh, Google or something like that. And it knows the location of all, all these places. And it knows where you are. But it's not using any data coming in from your camera and augmenting that. It's just, aug it's just overlaying the information distance and relative to where you are. And you can combine it. And uh, one cute example of that is a, an app that came out from Japan, actually, about four or five years ago. It's called Balloon Fishing. So it uses where you are. Uh, and first of all, let's say it uses uh, the camera to try to search for any type of cylindrical object, some sort of circle. And it turns that into uh, a fishing lake of any type. It could be small, it could be big, it could be uh, medium size, it could be a little bit oblique as well, if that's okay. And then you could use your phone and kind of like fish, like you were fishing with a pole, and it would dip into the water and you can pull out a fish. Now, where you are physically, using the GPS data, determine what kind of fish you pulled out of the water. So you're using the camera to augment the reality of the circle in the cup, and you're using your DPS data to let you know where you are in the world and what kind of rare kind of fish you might pull out of the water. And that's just a cute example of using both of those uh, combined together. There's another way of looking at the types, and uh, that's using the camera data that's in real time and in your point of view or using uh, recorded data, recorded video, as it were. So you could uh, have a recording of you know, maybe even a movie, and that was reality, but uh, it's not in real time, and it's not your own personal point of view, cause, and that also could be two different uh, types of augmented reality. So what does that mean for us? Uh, there's a couple of uses like this is already happening in language learning. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples a little later, but a couple of types and examples with those is, has anyone ever heard of web quests? Web quests? Web quests is a, sort of a uh, online uh, model for assi uh, uh, online assignments. They have five portions to them. And you basically you inquire, it's a, it's a uh, five steps model to go through and use the internet and search for something and have assignments based on it. And what this does is takes your GPS data and adds that on to the assignment. So you actually have to go to different physical places. It could be on your campus. It could be outside in the real world. And as soon as you get to that location, your phone will know it, give you some new information, perhaps an assignment, or tell you to take a picture, or tell you to interview someone that might be in the vicinity as well. And a uh, well-known application is called Eris for that. And the second one, you can actually track and translate characters in, in some languages already. There's an application called WordLens. You point that up to a sign in Spanish, and it will augment the Spanish written word into English. Uh, the, the still no... Uh, that, that particular application still doesn't have the Eastern languages in the game. And now, what I'm going to be talking about today is tagging images and markers, kind of like what I showed you before, and enhancing them with other types of media. So you have a textbook, could be any textbook, and there's some pictures in there, but you want to show a video or add a quiz or um, 
maybe you have some listening activities based on that picture in the textbook. And now you can take your phone and target that image and display any type of information that you like. So <clears throat> there's been a lot of advancement in this re recently, could because mainly because of the process. It takes a lot of processing power to analyze and uh, calculate all the different uh, data that's coming in from your camera phone, and that they're actually making new uh, graphical chips just for this function. And uh, there's four main companies. They all have different niches, but uh, they're mainly in. Uh, enhancing print. And there's LIAR, Ariel, Junio, and Parasma. And uh, they all have different, different niches. LIAR is mainly for large print companies. It's, that one's used by uh, the Japan Times. And uh, Ariel is an Indian company. Uh, Junio is mainly used in engineering. They take, they've been doing some amazing things like uh, pointing, if an engineer wants to know, they're looking at an engine in a car. They'll take a picture of that engine, and it'll give them step-by-step -step instructions on what to pull out, what parts are what, and things like that. Nasima is probably, right now, most used in the education profession, mainly because the other three are outrageously priced. And uh, the Arasima functions can be done easily and actually has functionality built into it where you can actually have students build these types of materials without having a lot of... Uh, expertise in perhaps like graphic design or things like that. <clears throat> and I'm going to put up some information at the end, so if there's something that you want to know, the websites or the, uh, the literature I've been viewing, you can go to the, my website later and uh, get all that information as well. So what can you enhance your textbooks with? Right now, there's a bunch of different options we can do. You can put an image on top of an image, overlay that on your textbooks. You can put in a video that could be streamed from YouTube or something that's already downloaded into your phone. You can uh, listen to some audio, both, of course, in your phone and streaming, streaming as well. You have 3D models, uh, the, like the ones I showed you before. We're using the um, markers. You can link to a website. You can feed. Uh, Twitter feeds and uh, Facebook likes and things like that. And very interestingly, you can put HTML5 content on top of things. So it can actually interact with the materials in some cases, you, not all of them, uh, especially the liar, you can do that too. So for example, you have a picture, I'll show an example of this, and you put an HTMI layer on top of it, and now that becomes a quiz or some interactive media. <clears throat> so why do this, right? There's here's some rationale involved. And the, my thinking and how I'm designing these things and the why I'm designing these. So students, especially in my classes, are using their seraphones a lot, and sometimes even in class, and not necessarily for learning. So one of the reasons is I want to try and use that uh, try to, to get the phone to be used as a learning tool and less uh, be seen more as a learning tool. And I want to have it act as sort of like a bridge to have the students find more places to learn outside of their textbook that relate to the contents in it. So uh, there's a class website that uh, my materials link to that have more information. Uh, social media that are, if we're discussing a particular topic, you, they can uh, link that link out and then find uh, ongoing discussions on that particular issue. And then link out to other learning apps and games in which uh, other students can get involved and play together. So basically, it's a bridge. And what I, what I expect will happen as I roll these out is that they'll use it initially to scan stuff from the textbook and it'll send them out to a website or some uh, reference guide but after it's used several times, they'll probably stop actually using the actual AR data and just go to the actual <coughs> reference online. So designing these things, this is a sample page. I'm going to show you a little bit about this later. But 
uh, designing them, you, you can you can do this go about this two ways. You can look at you can take an existing uh, textbook and try and tag it, trying to find some image in it that you can that the, the uh, smartphone can recognize and augment that in some way. Or you can take your own pictures and print them out. And this is uh, an example of one I have here. So you'll notice there's a bunch of uh, white space on the bottom there, and that's on purpose because I'm going to fill that up with uh, buttons to press. And I, it's very confusing to put that over text. Thank you. <coughs> and there's a vocabulary list there and a, a dialogue up on top. And they're all images. I've done that by design. So it's kind of, when you take the print design, uh, you have to know a little bit about that and spacing and having white space involved. But you also have to put interactive elements on top of that. And that involves a little bit of web design as well, especially responsive web design, because they have to actually fit within the same uh, ratios or same uh, uh, area of the page as what's seen um, in the actual page itself. So the, the picture, if you're going to overlay a picture on something, it has to have the same dimensions. So some considerations uh, when designing things like that. So you, you're going to try and uh, have an image to be tagged so that you need to actually get the whole image into your field of view on the camera. So if it's too big, students might have to step back a bit and then it's going to become impossible for a student to actually bring out or tag out that image inside your print. But if it's too small, then the, the uh, camera might uh, not be able to focus well enough to read that data. What I just mentioned before earlier, the uh, aspect ratios need to match up. Uh, if you have elongated image, it doesn't look well when it's overlaid on top of a, you know, a, a, a wide image. It makes it noisy. And uh, if you're inputting a lot of different markers into a, uh, to be scanned, and a lot of them are similar, and because this technology isn't perfect still, you might get a lot of mistakes in having a computer recognize one image when it should be another. I did something where I took a lot of the students giving their self-introduction in English and I tried to make a book with their faces and their faces, uh, when the, the augmented reality came over it, they would, uh, the video would pop up of them giving their uh, self-introduction. But this background was the same and uh, a lot of, the, if the facial shape was close, Sometimes a different student would pop up. So this is a, a through a department in my university that we're doing some um, community outreach. This is a public for free course called Travel English. that anyone could join. It's a textbook that I created a couple years ago and now I'm enhancing it with these augmented reality uh, tools. Let's see here. You can see that, yep. So I have the, the four top uh, AR on the top there. Lyar, Ariel, Junior, Asima, as I mentioned before. I know first I'm gonna show you the Lyar. So here's a, thank you, uh, the cover. Of, could be an ebook, could be uh, printed material, and I'm just going to go over it. And now that becomes a video. You can look around, up, down, around, left, and you touch it, and it just takes you to a YouTube page that introduces the course. The page I showed earlier, this is the first page of a self introduction dialogue page. I'm just going to overlay that. And now uh, there is a some buttons down there where you can listen to the actual recording of the dialogue in question up top there. And you can actually pop this out so now it becomes, now you, you don't have to actually look at it. And this is a carousel. You go back and forth and look at the different, there's questions here. And I've uh, integrated in uh, Quizlet. Does anyone know what Quizlet is? 
So that's that you can port that out as an HTML5. So I've overlaid that on top of the vocabulary. And you can now I'm supposed to be able to hear that. And uh, you can go through all the vocabulary and listen to the English and Japanese in that. And there's some other links in here um, linking back to the website for this particular text that I've created and take a quiz on it. So, It's not just about the textbooks either. You want to give a little piece of exploration to the idea. So what I'm doing is I put some Easter eggs in. You can scan different things around the campus, and that gives some uh, surprising information. So you get students trying to use this uh, around the campus. I put up posters in the classroom, one for each chapter in the textbook. And uh, they can go and get the uh, a review on that specific. And if they, in, the, in the lobby, you can go down and scan a poster in the lobby and get announcements for the course. And I'm going to be porting this out on a proliferate basis uh, to two classes coming up. Uh, I have four tablets on them that you can use in the class, but this is all outside of the class, and I'm just going to be analyzing <coughs> the app usage and the web traffic uh, because this is not a part of the actual assignments in class. About, just about run out of time, so if you want some more information, my website, my email, my Twitter, and my Facebook. I'd uh, like it very much if everyone uh, friended me up or sent me a message. And uh, thanks very much for listening. I think we have maybe a minute or two for questions if there are any. Um, yes? Yeah, so I've, I've used Eris before, and, and you can only use it. You can design, of course, on, on any sort of uh, system, but you can only use iOS for for playing Eris, uh, is there any sort of limitations with uh, the OS with those other uh, things that you talked about? The four that I listed there are both Android and uh, iOS. I think only Lyar and the Matayo can do Windows phones. Um, there's a lot of things, lim other limitations though to the Lyar. For example, if you can only use it for free if you're logging, creating things and logging in with your own account. So I've tried to get creative and uh, created a public account and created some items with that and students can log in with the university mail or something to use it. But if you wanted to make it public, this takes a lot of processing power and, and things like that too. So for the 100 page textbook, and if I wanted to make that public, that would cost 5,000 euros for a year to make that public. And that's I don't know about you guys' budget. <laughs> That's nothing what I have. And, uh, but the uh, Arasama one, uh, with very limited functionality, using only links, images, and videos, you can use that as much as you want for free. So for, t for us, that's probably the best option right now. Great, thanks. Uh, question. Can I ask what university you're at? I didn't see the... Oh, sure. Uh, it's called Seibi University. It's here in Kyoto Prefecture, but it's not in the city. It's up in the mountains. Okay. It's in Fukuchiyama, which is about 90 minutes north, huh? uh, closer to the Sea of Japan. I think it's the only university in Kyoto that's not in the city. Uh, we have a medical information technology school, a tourism school, and a business design school. All right. <laughs> Nothing else? All right. Well, thanks for listening. Thank you. Hi, sorry I, I ran late, but I, the reason I was asking is that I, I was actually pitching some AR stuff to my university. Nice. And I was wondering if I might, it might be possible to come and see. Uh, what you're doing, sure. or you, like you got all the posters. And I got some videos online and things like oh, okay. that too. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh,